All right, in this video, we're going to review what extrema are, talk about um, extreme value theorem and mean value theorem, and then within mean value theorem, we'll talk about what Rolle's theorem is. So an extrema is just kind of a general term for all the max and mins. Now there's really two types of max and mins. There's absolute min, which means the very smallest point on the graph, so like over here. Um, an absolute max, which is the very biggest point on the graph. And then there's relative mins and relative maxes. So things that are temporarily a max and things that are temporarily a minimum. <clears throat> so all of those make up extrema. All right, and one term I'm going to start to throw out quite a bit for the rest of the semester is a critical number. And a critical number is when the derivative is zero or undefined. Um, so relative extrema can only occur at critical numbers. So notice slope of the tangent line and all of those relative extrema all have a slope of zero temporarily. All right, so the extreme value, well, before we get to that, let's go ahead and fill in uh, some of the blanks here. So for the function shown above, we have relative max at uh, D and B, those X values. Both of these points are relative maximum since they are interior of the domain and the largest point on the graph and in some interval around that point. So around this interval, it's the highest point, and around this interval is the highest point. So temporarily, it's the highest point at least. We also have relative mins at x equals c. Since this point is in the inside of the domain, and it's the lowest point in the interval around it. The far right endpoint, x equals e, would not be a relative in minimum because it is an endpoint. So since I don't know, like the other side of the graph doesn't exist here, like it's, it's not necessarily going up. So we cannot assume that this is a relative min. It is not a relative min at E. Okay, so what extreme value theorem says, it has to do with the extrema, so that's why we were reviewing that. Extreme value says if you've got a continuous function on the closed interval, then you have an absolute max and an absolute min. So that's kind of common sense. Like you've got a function between two values, it's continuous. One of them has to be the highest point, one of them has to be the lowest point. So the job of the extreme value theorem is to help you find those extremes, the max and the min. So it helps us find absolute max and absolute min. Okay, before we go over these, let's look at what are the possibilities. So an absolute max can be a relative max, and an absolute max doesn't have to be at a relative max. An absolute min could be at a relative min, and it may not be. So our only candidates, what the extreme value theorem is going to tell us, is that our candidates for the absolute max are all the critical numbers and the endpoints. Anytime where your function is turning around, it's going to have a relative max or relative min. And then if we check the endpoints, then we have all the candidates for the biggest value and the smallest value. Okay, so sometimes we're going to just be asked to find the critical points, um, like the start of number one here. So critical points are when the derivative is zero or one half, or I'm sorry, zero or undefined. I'm reading the problem and talking at the same time. Okay, so there's a the derivative, and this is never undefined, but it equals zero when x equals zero and when x equals negative two. Okay, so those are our, our critical numbers. And so those are likely to be 
relative maxes and relative mins. They're not really guaranteed. We've got to do more work to know that for sure. Um, <clears throat> but then the other possibilities for a relative max and min are the endpoints. So we have to test zero and three, and zero is already one of the points. So let's just plug them in and see. When x is zero, plug it into the function, we get zero. Uh, when x is negative two, I'm gonna throw this in my calculator real quick. We get four thirds. And when x is three, we get 18. So extreme value theorem just says test out all the critical points and test out all the endpoints. Your absolute max and your absolute min has to occur at some of those values. So now I can see this has the smallest y value. So the absolute min is at x equals zero and a value of zero. And the absolute max is 18 and it occurs at x equals three. So if you wanna go ahead and graph that in your calculator and just look at those x values, you can see this, this would be the smallest y value in that segment of the graph, and this would be the biggest y value in that segment of the graph. So that's all we're testing. Okay, determine all extrema for this function. Okay, so let's find the critical numbers. So critical numbers are where the first derivative is zero or undefined. Doesn't look like it's ever undefined. And we could factor out a three, and it's just a quadratic, so we can solve that without a calculator. Looks like the critical numbers for this one is only negative one. And so negative one may be an extrema. Um, and negative two and three may be absolute maxes or mins. So to actually see what's going on, we would need to plug those in. So I'm gonna store negative one in my calculator and ask it, what is x cubed plus three x squared plus three x plus one? And it says that's zero. Store negative two instead. Store in three instead. So extreme value theorem is telling us what to test. I tested all the critical numbers and I tested the endpoints. And now I can see where the absolute max is and I can see where the absolute min is, at least for those values between two and three, that would be the absolute max and absolute min. All right, so that's all extreme value theorem is telling us to do. And so if you really kind of study this graph, I think that makes sense. If you understand why these are critical numbers, the derivative is zero there, you can see it's possible for a relative max to be an absolute max, um, but just because it's a critical number doesn't mean it's the smallest value, you still have to test the endpoints. So here is an endpoint that shows you a value smaller than where one of the critical numbers were. Okay, another one, and probably more important, is the mean value theorem. So if f is a function that is differentiable on the closed interval a, b, there exists a point c in the values a, b, the open interval a, b, such that the derivative at c is equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Well, this, I know it's kind of a mouthful here, but this is just the slope formula. So it's really saying like, why don't you look at the slope of the whole interval? We're talking about a to b. So like if you took the point at f of a, compared it to f of b, and you just found like the average slope. Well, if this is a function that's differentiable, which implies that it's continuous, so I know the slopes are gonna have to change through here, but somewhere, at least once, what this average slope was at least once it's gonna to have to have that same slope. And where that happens, we call that C, or the mean value theorem calls it C. So let's do that here. 
let's think about the slope of this just between between negative 2 and 3. So negative 2 and positive 2. Sorry, I said 3, but 2. Okay, so if I plugged in negative 2, that would be 2. So let's plot that. And then if I plugged in positive 2, that is negative 6. Okay, so if I think about rise over run, uh, y2 minus y1, it looks like it's going down 8, and since I'm sketching a visual here, we can see that it goes down 8. And the run would be from 2 minus negative 2, so the run is 4, so this guy has a slope of negative 2. Okay, now this function has a lot of zigzag to it. Graph it if, if you want to see it. But I'm just talking about the uh, left end of the interval compared to the right end of the interval. But really, this thing's got a lot of stuff going on here. <clears throat> but if this has an overall slope of negative 2, no matter what this graph looks like, and I'm actually going to graph it in my calculator to give you an accurate picture here. So it does this, goes down a bunch, back up, and then like this. Goes on that way, goes on this way. Okay, so the mean value theorem says there's at least one place where um, it's going to have that same slope. So this slope of connecting those, we can kind of visualize. Uh, it looks a little too steep here, but... but maybe about right here somewhere, the slope's about the same, and then it goes up, positive slope for a while, and then it turns around, so then maybe somewhere right about here it's the same. So it looks like there's two places, two values there, um, where it might also have a slope of negative two. So for us to find those locations, find those values of C, or that value of C, we would take the first derivative, so that we can be thinking about slope. Uh, we would find, no, set it equal to negative two. When is the slope negative two? And that's a quadratic, so quadratics, of course, we need to uh, put in standard position there. And then if I try to solve this, see how much of this I can do without a calculator, uh, I could factor out a negative and a 2. Okay, and then I could set negative 2 equal to 0, which of course doesn't make sense. And I could set 3x squared minus 4 equal to 0, and that would be x squared is 4 thirds. And if we do uh, the square root of both sides, don't forget plus or minus, and the square root of 4 thirds would be 2 over the square root of 3, or plus or minus 2 square root of 3 over 3, if you want to rationalize it. So I have this typed in my calculator, so if you did the same thing, jump to the x value of 2 square root of 3 over 3, and you can see that I was actually pretty close in guessing that one, it's right there. And then negative 2 <coughs> square root of 3 over 3. I was also very close. It was right there. So these are the x values, or mean value theorem likes to call them. C. Those are the values that have a slope of 2. And the reason why I cared that it had a slope of 2 is because, or negative 2, is because negative 2 was the slope between those two endpoints. Um, so assuming that it's differentiable, which implies that it's continuous, 
that has to happen at least once. That's what the mean value theorem says. All right, and then finally, Rolle's theorem is actually just kind of a piece of mean value theorem, a very specific example of that. So it says if it's continuous on B, AB and differentiable on open AB, and if A equals B, so let's think about that up here. If A equals B, then what you're really saying is that the slope is zero. So in this question, we had a slope of negative two. But if it's got no rise, then it has a slope of zero. Then there's some value of C where the derivative would equal zero. Okay, well that's exactly what we said, it's just more specific. In the last question, I found a C value that had a slope of negative two because that was the slope between the uh, values of the interval. This is just saying it has a slope of zero, so there must be some value of C that has a instantaneous slope of zero. Okay, so let's try it out. Find all the numbers C guaranteed by Rolle's theorem for f of x equals x squared minus 4x plus 1. Make sure that you check the conditions here. All right, well, this is a polynomial, so it will be differentiable and continuous, so we're not too worried about that. Um, f of a compared to f of b, these need to be equal, but let's plug in 0 to get 1 and plug in 4 to get 1. So it looks like the conditions are being met here. Um, so it looks like the slope between a and b, I have no idea what this graph looks like, but I know the overall slope is 0. And so there must be some x value in here that is also zero. So like maybe this graph goes up and then back down, but somewhere it has to have a temporary slope of zero. Or maybe it goes down and up, but the same thing. It has to have at least one value where that is zero. So let's set the first derivative equal to zero so we can figure out when is the slope zero. And that is when x is 2. So this was actually 0, and this was 4. And so this time it was exactly in the middle at 2. So the most important thing I want you to get out of Rolle's theorem is to just see it's exactly the same as mean value theorem. It's just very specific where uh, f of a equals f of b. But mean value theorem is uh, can include this and all the other stuff. So it's a little bit more important. Okay, if you would pause and try number four and then resume when you come back. All right, so it looks like the conditions for Rolle's theorem checked out. Um, f of zero was five, f of two was five. So those are equal, which means the slope between those two endpoints overall was zero. And so Rolle's theorem, or mean value theorem, says there must be at least one time where it is also zero. Now, I went ahead and grafted it in my calculator to give me a visual, so I can see, if you zoom in there, it looks like there's one, two places, uh, two values of C, where there was also a slope of zero. So, I found the first derivative, set it equal to zero to find the critical numbers, tried to factor it, it doesn't look like it factored, so I threw it in the equation solver in the calculator, and there's one thing here you definitely need to be careful with on equation solver. So if you go and do that, you hit alpha enter, it gives you an answer. And your calculator is only smart enough to give you one answer. So it gives you the one closest to the number you had in there before you started. So like if you have a one there and you hit alpha enter, it's gonna give you the first answer, which is about 1.577, which is where I got that answer. But it happens at more than one place and this is one thing that's a little tricky about equation solver. It doesn't tell you that there might be a second answer. Since it's a quadratic, we have to know that. Um, so the other one is C. This is over here by 2. So I said, well, what if you try closer to 0? So if you put in 0 before you hit alpha enter, the first one it finds then is 0.423, which is where I got that one. So there was two numbers guaranteed by Rolle's theorem um, between that interval on that function. So 
that is on that one. All right, the last of the notes, just a couple practice questions if you want to try. Um, this is a previous release question on the Cal BC test, although this is an AB question, so if you want to try it, you can Google search it and see the answer. Um, and then kind of a neat application where mean value theorem could um, uh, apply to, I guess, proof of um, speeding or not speeding in the real world. So feel free to give those a shot, but you really need to make sure that you know the purpose of extreme value theorem and how to apply it, and the purpose of mean value theorem and how to apply it. And if you're good with mean value theorem, then Rolf's theorem is just a subset of that.